Dr. Guida Adriansen from Amsterdam uh, is going to inform us. Welcome, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for this introduction. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to uh, share some of my thoughts on recurrences, because eventually it needs to be away and not recur, because the moment it starts recurring, the whole problem starts to becoming more and more difficult. But uh, first, I have to disclose uh, nothing else than uh, that it's absolutely nice here in Greece this time of year. And these are the points I would like to discuss a little bit. A little bit on the properties of inverted papilloma and then certain challenges in the management with respect to recurrences. So looking from the glasses of the first hit should be the definite hit and how to make sure that it's uh, the, 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 the solving hit instead of ending up in multiple revision cases which become more and more difficult. Follow up, the completeness of resection and where. Attachments, HPV a little bit, some other factors and maybe an adjuvant therapy that you can consider. We try it at least. So first of all, inverted papilloma comes from the Schneiderian epithelium which covers the whole nasal cavity and the nasal sinuses and actually it's ectodermally derived and there it differs from airway epithelium which is endodermally derived, so it's not totally the same. And the majority of these papillomas are inverted, 50 to 80 percent, but we already talked about that. Importantly, um, inverted papilloma is benign. We all saw these numbers also with Mario, so I'm very happy that I'm showing the same numbers because sometimes they differ, but we're actually <laughs> telling exactly the same numbers which is nice, but on the other hand, it, is, it can be locally aggressive, it can even grow invasively, it has a focal or malignization uh, potential, it can grow expansively and, and through pressure invade other structures, and it's fairly unsensitive to radiotherapy. And I think when you start operating inverted papillomas, at least to me, it's important to mention this sort of dilemma that's in this thing, because it's benign, so people or patients don't really accept a lot of morbidity. But in order to have a complete resection, you need to perform radical surgery, and not functional surgery. And radical not in the idea that you start cutting turbinates, but radical in the idea that you radically remove the attachment sites. And at first operation, this is the best way or the easiest way to find them. In revision cases, the principle is the same. You have to find attachments, but this can become more difficult. The tumor bulk, if it's not attached to a middle turbinate, you leave the middle turbinate, but you find the attachments, and around those attachments, you're really, really radical. And this is a balance, because you perform radical surgery, and sometimes you perform morbidity for your patients, and especially if you do revision surgery, and still the patients think, but ho, oh, it's benign. So you need to be aware of this and not just go in, it's a unilateral polyp, I'll remove it, I can't reach this supraorbital recess, this is enough for now. Then you really have, have done wrong to the patient and you should think about that before you start. So complete, at first surgical, focused at the attachments, really important. Now, the opportunity to uh, get this goal is best at first surgery, and I have some numbers of our series. Um, we published uh, 2003 until 2013 with at least one year follow-up, and now I added the cases up until 2018 with at least two years follow-up. We have more cases, primary vision, but just look at the effect of just follow-up on recurrence. So if you want to reduce your occurrence, <laughs> don't do so much follow-up, but of course it's the other way around. Follow-up really, and it's not just one or two years, and this is not just the group um, that had one year follow-up that uh, over the years made more, but also sometimes at five years you see a recurrence, sometimes even at the same site, even though it's five years uh, um, gone by then. So. In our center, at least, we more and more uh, recommend a lifelong follow-up even, even though the periods between follow-up after the first two years can become 
longer and longer. So follow-up is an important factor, unfortunately, in recurrence. So this first surgery, I can stress it not enough. In my opinion, it should be, I call it centripetal surgery. So you work around all the edges of the tumor, and if you see it's not attached, you take it away. And so centripetally, you work your way towards the attachment, and then you become really aggressive at the attachment. You remove the perichondrium or periosteum, you drill it, you coagulate of all attachments. So attachments is one of the things that are really important in recurrences. And the, the easier you find the attachment, the easier or probably more successful your operation is, uh, the more difficult you have in finding it, uh, the, diff the more difficult it becomes. So you should at least do a great effort before starting your surgery on finding those attachments with imaging or whatever. Logically, multiple attachments, you think, would re uh, uh, end up in more recurrences. And there's actually a paper that published uh, just this, that multifocal attachment is associated with increased recurrence with an odds ratio of 3.5. So it's always a little higher, so the risk is probably three times higher. And it makes sense because you have to find them all and not just one. Another point, um, which is already talked about a little bit, is the HPV. And there is quite a lot of discussion whether it has an etiological um, uh, effect in, in inverted papilloma or not. And uh, some say yes, some say no. Um, but there are soon to be a meta-analysis published. I had to review it. That's the perk sometimes of reviewing these things of a Korean group, and they try to find all studies and do a meta-analysis published on at least HPV and cyanonasal inverted papilloma. And they actually did find a uh, positive uh, effect on SNP recurrence with an odds ratio of 2.9, also in subgroups where they uh, divided the, det the detection methods on, on fluorescence in situ hybridization versus BCR or geographical region, they made two groups, Eastern and Western, that's very interesting, or even publication year, before and after 2000, and every time they find at least a positive correlation of HPV positive versus more recurrence of your inverted papilloma. And uh, listening to your talk with HPV 11, I realized that in our population we also have not many, three, four, five, where at least I found out it was um, um, HPV positive, and they were also all 11, and these are, these are terrible cases. Um, and maybe, because there are even vaccines on the market against, or, or to protect from, eh, from the cervical uh, cancer, um, maybe there is an idea of introducing somewhere a vaccine against HPV in a subgroup population of inverted papilloma. Could be. But of course, the difficulty herein lies uh, the numbers, because unfortunately, uh, it's a difficult problem. Fortunately, it doesn't occur that much, but that means it takes a long while to gather lots of data. So that's another factor, at least, to consider in recurrences of inverted papilloma. We also reviewed 72 of our revision cases and looked at uh, different factors um, associated with at least revisions. Difficulty in finding the attachment sites, of course. In revision surgery, often there is scarring, the margins are unclear, anatomy is differ different, especially if it's revision cases that you have not operated yourself, because then you have to rely on an OR report, which is not always very accurate. We did find that, uh, but, but at least it's an average, the Krause stage are higher in revision cases than, uh, than not. Different distribution in the attachment sites, so frontal recess, and we do also really have frontally attached uh, inverted papillomas, more in the revision cases than in the total ones, and we found a higher incidence of dysplasia. So coming back to the surgery, which is the treatment for inverted papilloma, um, you have to go back to the attachment and finding this attachment, which can be really challenging 
and this is a little bit already a rep repetition of what's been mentioned, but you can use CT scans or MRI scans. Um, I'll skip this a little bit. We saw these pictures of the osteitic signs. We saw the cerebriform convoluted pattern. Here's some more examples. And it can help you to guide you towards the attachment. But still, if you find an osteitic sign, don't think, ah, there it is, and go in without looking at the rest. You should still very carefully perform. Be sure that it's not attached before you remove or debulk the inverted papilloma and work your way centripetally towards these attachments. So, do not perform FES on unilateral polyposis. Find the attachments and be very meticulous and complete in your resection at first surgery and very radical towards the attachment. Be radical in that perspect. And if you feel like, well, maybe it's also into the supraorbital recess and you think, I don't know if I can reach, be sure to you know, do it together with somebody who at least knows how to reach. Because if you leave one cell, it will recur and you've set back your other recurrences uh, a great many percentages. So take that into account. Of course, finding those attachments can be a challenge. It's not always straightforward, especially in revision cases. Because of, for example, scarring, difficult to reach, the supraorbital recess or the cribriform plate, difficult to perform thorough drilling without going into dura or, or fat, or the difficulty to assess what's tumor from normal mucosa, especially again in revision cases, but sometimes it's just, it feels like it's attached everywhere in maxillary sinus at the papilloma sometimes. And um, we had these difficulties too and uh, in selected cases, cases like these, cases where we felt at the end of surgery that we really did our best, but we were not 100% sure, is it totally gone up until the last cell? Because you don't want to drill the whole cribriform plate, for example, and destroy smell, but it feels like you, but it's still a bit iffy. We started to use 5-FU as an adjuvant. We introduced it somewhere in 2008, I think, which is a topical chemotherapeutic agent. It interferes with DNA synthesis, acts on rapidly dividing cells. So one of the side effects of using this is that your healing is prolonged. It takes a longer time for the wound to heal. And if you apply it topically, um, the systemic absorption is really little to negligible. So it's relatively safe to use, and it has been used also for different neoplasias, also in the eye, uh, superficial BCC. It can cause local irritation. Yes, burning, crusting, healing takes longer, pain. But in these cases, and you're not sure, and you want to reduce recurrence, and you've already stretch towards your limits uh, in trying to um, um, radically remove all the attachments, it's like an extra add-on. And th this is, for example, a draft three with one of these gauzes in place. Um, we introduced this, again, only in patients where we were not sure, terrible cases, um, difficult. Eh? So from from the stance of this group, it's, it's a bad group, so to say. It's not the average inverted papilloma group. It's not everything in total. And then if you look a little bit at the numbers, before we introduced 5-FU, and you look at the primary and revision recurrence rate, 14 versus 29, only 31 cases, because it's up until 2008. Then after 5-FU, 10 years, a lot more cases, but they're all mixed. But you do see a decline in the recurrence rate. And then I also isolated the 5-FU group, and I separated them into primary and revision, and also a recurrent group, meaning a recurrent case is, and also I think those definitions in literature are really mixed, and it's important to pull them out from each other. 
A primary case is a case that comes in at our department, never operated only biopsy maybe, but a small one, not a huge one. Revision case, operated somewhere else. Coming in, we operate for the first time, but it has been operated elsewhere. Recurrence is a recurrence of our own. Um, and that group actually is the worst group where we already performed twice, the three times operations and it's still we feel Ooh, it's coming back. That's also the group where we find most HPV positive patients. But looking at this group, which is a worst case group, and although the numbers are still low, because, uh, well, in 10 years we used it 44 times, we had zero recurrence as a primary, but it's low number, eight, because wh wh why do you want to use it in a primary case, eh, basically? But some of these are just really terrible. Revision cases, 17, and still it's a lot less than before the group. So, well, you cannot directly say it's a good idea, but at least it looks promising and it does not do too much harm. I think we have two cases, one with irritation locally because the periorbit was exposed and, and uh, the eye became irritated, we just took it out and it resolved. And another one with uh, pain, maxillary pain. Oh, we take it out and eventually the pain uh, subsided, fortunately. So maybe this is another way to reduce recurrence Time will tell, maybe you just postpone your recurrence in the follow-up, but we'll see. For now it looks good and we already have 10 years of follow-up uh, from the first case. Do I have time for just a case still? Because that's the last and then I want to finish to see how to do this, is that okay? Yes, so yes, please, we example, you still have some time. Yes. How to, uh, to, to, to approach this in a male of 35 years, unilateral nasal blockage. Well, uh, biopsy after imaging. This is the imaging and I hope you can start the video actually. It doesn't run by itself. You have to, or can I remove that? No. You have to move the mouse and, and press play. If not, I can skip it because the imaging uh, shows a CT scan with hyperostosis around the cribriform plate and the lateral lamella where the etmoidal artery enters the lateral lamella and also some specs inside the frontal sinus and some in the frontal recess. So all kinds of, oh, there we go. Okay, now. Very nice. You see up there in frontal sinus, some osteotic maybe signs here around the corner, lateral lamella going down. This is a primary case actually. And all the way into the nasopharynx and then it goes back again. So yeah, it's probably there somewhere, cribriform plate, lateral lamella, but might extend into the frontal sinus. Now then it really helps if you have an MRI, because especially also T2 also really discerns between mucus trapped versus what's papilloma. And that's the next slide, and please, uh, if you can do the same with, uh, oh, the next one, this one, if you can do the same with uh, these videos, that will be very helpful. One is the T2 and the other one is the T1. Contrast enhanced, so you nicely see how the maxillary sinus is not involved. And yeah, can you find a convoluted cerebriform pattern? It's in the ethmoid. All the bone ethmoidal cells are in between. It's, it's difficult to see. It's a difficult case, I think. And so, let's see, the next one is a little bit the video. So if you can run it, it's two minutes, I think, and then it's done. This is how it looks. And you just look around, and if it's not attached, you can debulk. But only when it's attached, you should be radical. So you just start carefully debulking, centripetally, until you find a region where you think, ah, I'm not entirely sure anymore if it's loose or attached. So you remove everything uh, from uh, up until the nasopharynx, so your first pass, also to have a gutter, so your blood can get rid of. And then here in the anterior ethmoid, it feels like, hmm, might be involved in the middle turbinate. It's, it starts becoming difficult. So you mark it. 
you mark it, monopolar with, with the coagulation. And then you say, okay, behind here, it might be attached. So you try to go around. So it's sort of a centripetal ethmoidectomy. It's the, you see the unsnut process and you go underneath because it's still loose there. And you go behind, this is the posterior skull base behind the mass. You progress anteriorly. On the right side, you see the papyracea without mucosa. And you go back, and this cell, is it attached? Yeah, no, yes. Until you think, ah, maybe it's attached here. And then you have the front, the side, and the back. And then you start again from the front. This is getting close to admodal arteries. And then you start again from the front to go the other way around. Outside-in approach, basically the start of an outside-in approach for a draft 3 unilateral. Go in front of the tumor. I should speed this up a little bit. Almost. Find the other frontal sinus. Remove the septum a little bit to go around. This is on the other side, removing the cranial septum a little bit. And again, centripetally towards where it's attached. And the attachment, at least I think, is somewhere there, lateral lamella. But just be sure that you know where to focus, more or less, but during your surgery, always think, is it attached, yes or no, and demarcate around until, well, you make a draft three. Or at least it's not really a draft three because you leave the right ethmoid intact, actually, because you don't need to open that. It's, it's a really extended draft to be with the floor, the frontal sinus on the other side. And then work around, and here you see the hyperostotic bone. Remove that, drill that, coagulate this. And then I was still, but maybe I haven't removed enough in this area, which is a little bit tricky. So eventually, this is the end result. You see a nice draft three, skull base towards the back. And probably it was also a little bit attached in the um, frontal sinus. And you put in this gauze with some antibiotic cream mixed with this 5-FU cream. You leave it for three weeks, and then you take it out and you do careful cleaning. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, you don't have any, any infection in within these three weeks, you know, with the gaze? No, we covered it also so with an antibiotic cream. Okay, okay. And uh, lots of it, and we also give them uh, oral antibiotics during the time that the tampon is in situ. Well, we had one irritation. I don't know if it's an infection, okay. but then we took it out after two. So thank you very much for bringing up all the issues with the recurrences, so this multifocal lithi for example, could be an issue, perhaps. Uh, we are focusing only on one attachment site and not to the other one.